Thanks for tuning in to your day off podcast, hosted by your boys, Corey and Tony. I think by the end of today, I might have another best friend. They're committed to making you fall in love with the hair industry, one podcast at a time. Uh, you're going to grab a lot of information. Yeah, you're going to learn a lot. Presented by Hair Industry. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. Your day off podcast will begin after a word from our sponsors. Welcome to your day off. My name is Gordon. Of course, I'm sitting with, well, of course, I'm sitting with my best friend, Katie, these days. Um, Katie, uh, welcome, well, welcome back. Thanks. Are you, are you getting used to that seat? Not really. No? <laughs> it's still awkward? Um, It's not comfortable. <laughs> What's not comfortable the about chair. it? The chair. The chair. So it's the physical, like, yes, not comfortable. Yeah, like the actual chair. Got it. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, we can do better with it, like, go get a, go get a better chair. I see, like, a beanbag. A beanbag? Yeah. Kind of hippie shit is that? I know. Katie? I just want to be comfortable. Yeah, but if you're on a beanbag, then uh, that's all weird looking. The video would. It start... probably would look really weird. Yeah, and it'd be like because you'd be like half just... exactly. You'd be like, hey, but that'd be so comfortable. Yeah, but then I'd be... oh, I would literally and physically be talking down to you the whole time, and that's not good. Well, it's <laughs> awkward. Yeah, <laughs> you know, people people would have things to say about it. Maybe. Yeah, that's okay. So, uh, so I think it was literally last week. You call me one morning in, in the excited Katie way, and she goes, "Oh my God, have you read the uh, the white paper from Pivot Point? Um, it was about uh, basically how the industry is attending events and how they're um and, and and well, that's it. Like like how they're how they're showing up at events these days and how that's changed over the last few years. Um, so uh, Pivot Point, it, it, it's an amazing white paper. I kind of want to." Our guest today is Steve Reese, but my first question is, what's a white paper? Because I was an idiot. I didn't know what a white mm. paper was until I Googled white paper because I thought it would come up. And then, you know, there's a bazillion of them. So, you know, we'll, 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 we'll rely on Steve for that. But um, but but uh, so we get the white paper. So tell me about why why you're excited. Well, I was doing the most inappropriate thing and reading it on the way to work and halfway through. Um, she wrecked her car? No, I'm like, I'm pretty sure because normally I'll just text you but I'm emailing it to you, sending it to you, calling you. And I'm like, the, like, Corey, you, have you read this? Have you seen this? Right. It is so insightful. It, it, I mean, it's so hard for us to get um, research like this in our industry. And um, it was amazing. And I was floored. And I think um, if you've listened to a podcast a couple back, we were like, we were right. We were right. <laughs> right. <laughs> talking about events. And I just got so excited that we have this, you know, like proof that, you know, what we were thinking and what a lot of people have been thinking on kind of the more corporate level is right. Yeah. And, 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 we're, and we're on the right track. So it both felt good and also was just amazing to have this insight. Yeah. It, it, what I took from it was that it, one, to your point, it was like incredibly validating and like just the way that we've approached um, the way that we've approached events the last few years. And if you're listening in, you know, we're we're trying to evolve our company into more of an event space. We think that there's a lot of there's a lot of room um, to really focus on the attendees. I think as I think as a as a whole that the industry has um, over the years has kind of forgotten about the attendees. You know, I think that that a lot of these are so brand focused that sometimes the attendees get lost. I also think with the big shows, um, they're great. I, I love the big shows and I'm an advocate for the big shows, but I don't know if it's the best learning environment because you get in and your ADD is all crazy. And then you go and stand for a class for a, an hour or so. And then, you know, 20 or 25 minutes into the class, that's when you finally settle into like what's going on. Totally. So I don't know if it's yeah. the greatest um, learning environment, but, um, but for years we've been saying, these are our hunches. This is what, what we're seeing in the industry so you know for two idiots like ourselves it's really nice to actually have like some some white paper uh, uh, uh validation or some white paper like hey you guys are doing this right so do you, do you want to bring in the expert yeah let's do it so uh once again our our guest today is mr steve reese he is the executive director of strategic marketing and business insights at pivot point I thought we'd get like some intern or something. But, but Steve, <laughs> We're making uh, our way up. <laughs> Steve, was, Steve was nice enough to to get, to give us a few minutes of his time and and to uh, and to chat about these white papers. Hey, Steve, man, welcome to the podcast. Um, I am the executive director of Industry Insights. So we got the right guy then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Scratch we have that. the right guy. We got the guy that's in insights, and we're looking for some insights today. And I'm I'm happy to share whatever I can. Awesome. So, Steve, um, again, uh, uh, forgive my ignorance, but um, generally, what what's a white paper? 
A white paper is a nice way of, of, of taking um, information and putting it in an easy to read, easy to digest format. And it's just the name people use. When you say research, sometimes that sounds a little bit intimidating and people think they're going to be sinking in charts and data. And the goal of the white paper is to really explain something in a way that is meaningful uh, for people. That, 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 that's pretty cool. Um, and that it does. It does. Oh, my gosh. It's very easy to read. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, informative, but simple. <laughs> What um what what were you, what what were your initial like uh takes from it and uh let's chat with Steve about it. Oh my gosh, so um I mean it's a lot. There's still a lot of information even though it's simplified down. Um, I mean I guess at first I'd actually like to know um if, th if this was prompted or this like how did you guys decide to to do this research to get this research? That's that's really a good question. Uh. When I was at Modern Salon, we did a lot of research on a lot of topics. And at Pivot Point, uh, Pivot Point historically has done a lot of research. Most of it's been for internal purposes, but we've decided that we really need to start sharing uh, information, insights, and data with the industry as appropriate. We do a lot of business with uh, some of the leading brands because they purchase Pivot Point mannequins because of the quality and the consistency and a whole host of other reasons. And when we were talking to people, uh, different companies were saying, this is how our education has changed. And more often than not, people would say, what are other people doing? And what we went through in the past three or four years was this massive acceleration of people's use of technology and it changed behaviors in, in dramatic ways. And if you think about what you're doing right now in 2019, it was a very, very different type of situation than it is now. Now uh, our expectations are different. Our behaviors are different. And when we started talking to people, we realized that Everybody wanted validation that they were on the right path and they were doing the right thing. And they were talking internally, but they really hadn't talked in a broad sense externally and said, where's the market heading? Where's the market going? So that's how we decided to move ahead with this. Steve, did you, what were your big ahas from it? Did you have any ahas from it? Well, I'll give you a little bit more background um, before I, I get to the ahas. The, 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 the background was that we wanted to um, look at education, and we called it pre and post pandemic, not because that's really accurate, but because people had a good sense of what we were talking about. And we wanted people who were doing uh, in person education, but also online education. We wanted people who were producing their own education, but also participating in other people's education, third party education. We wanted a mix of these things. And we wanted people who had a good ear to the ground and a good sense of what was happening in real time. So we decided the most appropriate way to do this was to talk the uh, education leaders at the uh, at the top color companies because they really ticked off all the boxes. Plus, uh, Pivot Point works very, very closely with all of them. And as with your partners and your customers, you want to be able to add value by, by, by sharing things with them. So that was really what we did. We went out and we talked to all those people. We pulled together our notes and then we went back and we said, okay, is this what you expected to find? Is there anything that seems wrong or needs a little bit of tweaking? Is there anything that needs additional context? And based on that, we put together the white paper. That's, that's amazing. I, um, a, my, my, one of my takeaways was just how like things are getting more condensed. Like, like the shows seem to be getting like, like from the, if, again, from the attendees point of view, like they're looking for more bang for the buck, I guess is, 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 is what I took from it. Yeah. I mean, the biggest thing is, is, um, the shows, I think it said three days, shrink to two or something that can be done in a day, a half a day. That was huge. And I think also um, it's across the board, whether it's in person or virtual, just shrinking it down more look and learns. And less, like, like if you're doing an in-person class, mm -hmm. the expectations through the roof. And and we see that, but we a hundred percent see that. And so like reading through it was like, you know, 
um, not only we're on the right track, but the fact that it's like across the industry and it's not just our little world of who we're touching. It just was um, really enlightening in that way. Yeah, I, I would. I would agree. Yeah. You can really think about it in terms of two different audiences. And one audience is the brands and the other audience is beauty professionals. So think about it from a brand perspective. Um, all of a sudden, salons in 2020, salons were shut down. Uh, nobody had any visibility into what was going to be happening or how long it was going to take and what the other side was going to look like. Meanwhile, you had a lot of uh, brands who were very focused on in-person events. And there was this swift adoption of technology and people really hadn't thought it through. They hadn't said these are going to be best practices or, or these are the considerations. It's we have to stay in touch with our marketplace and we have to stay in touch with our customers and we're not doing these live events anymore. What can we do? So this swift adoption of technology and all the lessons learned that went with it. At the same time, uh, brands started looking at things differently because they traditionally spent a tremendous amount of money on live events and people traveling around the country. And all of a sudden they weren't spending that money. And what it really had them do when things started recovering a little bit was looking at things and saying, wow, maybe there is a better way to do things. Maybe we need to reconsider. There are a lot of things that you do just based on this is how we've always done it. And now people are questioning everything. They're saying, is there a better way to do it? Um, and, and what that really transitioned to is brands led with live in person and filled in the gaps with digital. And now it's exactly the opposite. They're leading with digital and they're filling in the gaps with live. If you think in terms of salon professionals, think about their expectations. Uh, they basically didn't have live in-person education for a long time. A lot of them are used to it. They learned how to use online. We all learned how to use Teams and Zoom and things like that. We all spent a lot more time with social media because we were at home, we weren't getting around as much and their expectations changed. And just like we now realize, I don't necessarily have to go there for this. I can watch this online. The same thing happened with them. So their expectation was, I want to be more conscious of my time and, and think about the office you used to go into five days a week. Yeah. You didn't go in at all. And now you're going in three days a week. And maybe that even feels like too much. It's the same thing with, with events. Uh, people in the salon industry, salon professionals, they're looking at their time differently and it's a currency. They're just not going to give up. Uh, and one of the challenges is I keep hearing that people are waiting to last minute to book things. Yes. And, think about it when you're focused on live things in person people had to make travel plans car airplane hotel all those types of things people got very used to waiting until the last moment and this fear of missing out is something better going to come along and that's really transcended all aspects of their education wow that's such a great point was there anything was there anything in the white paper or uh maybe wasn't put in the white paper but uh, to talk about like what people were willing to pay or or, or uh, like a cost analysis of like how much money they're spending on on education we 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 didn't talk about it specifically but we we did ask them what would make you do this so thinking about online first when all the brands started putting everything online because they had to stay in touch with their markets Nobody really had any thoughts about what should the cost structure be? What should be free? What should be paid? Are there different tiers? They just wanted to maintain contact with the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And now that we've gone through this, people are starting to figure out, okay, I'm willing to pay for this. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to pay for that. But the bottom line is that if you've got salon professionals who've had the expectation over the past few years that pretty much everything is free, it's going to be hard to get them to pay for things. And if you're going to get them to pay for things, there has to be a significant value add. And the value add could be, it's a critically important topic. It gets me together with a bunch of people I really need to spend time with. There's uh, a big name speaker there. There's a big goodie bag that I want to get my hands on. But it, it, it's, it's got to be something special. And you touched upon this when we first started in terms of the smaller events. And it's not necessarily smaller events, it's more intimate events. Yeah. The word intimate came up again and again and again. 
And that can be intimate in terms of a live event where there are a lot of people there, but within that large group of people, you're able to find your tribe and you're able to go off and, and, and work with the people you want to work with. Or it could be with online events where it used to just be a big Zoom and everyone's invited. Now everything's a lot more nuanced. You have the big Zoom that everyone's invited in the webinar, but you also have meeting rooms that people can go into in Zoom and a whole host of other things. So it's behaviors, but the behaviors were really uh, driven by a lot of the technology that's available. Zoom now is not like Zoom four years ago in terms of what its functionality is. No, completely. it's so true, right? Like that's definitely, we haven't done that yet, but we're, we've been looking into it. It's just, we can't find a cost effective way to do it, you know, to do the, to do the zoom or to do like our events, like with a live or, or with a, like a digital aspect of it. I mean, all fair, I'd love to uh, pick your brain about, about how, how actually, why don't we get into it? What, like how are brands doing that? How are brands like molding the two? Well, if, if, if you think about a broad sense, um, everybody adopted a lot of digital right away. Mm -hmm. And digital can be lots of things. It can be podcasts, webcasts, Facebook Live. It can be a whole host of things. Uh, but people just kind of did it. And over time, they became more familiar with this is what this platform does well. This is what this platform doesn't do as well. And the... Online, the digital hasn't really gone away as the live has come back. They're just filling in the gaps with the live, understanding that for a live event to be valuable, it's got to offer you something that you can't get with the online. You can't serve up the same package with both of them and expect them both to get the same level of attention. Well, and something else that was mentioned in the paper was the with the ages. And I'm a millennial and I'm of kind of, I think, the older stylist that really sees the benefit of being in person with education. Like I see, especially for myself, I'll just speak for myself, but when I'm doing education, if I'm doing watching something online, I, I just get so distracted and there's so many things I just can't focus. Whereas when I'm in person, and having hands on or anything like that, I'm just, it's way more valuable to me. And um, so for us with our events, when we speak on intimate, it's having the connection and it being kind of a smaller event, but being able to touch more people and, and have more conversation and be intimate in that way. Um, and so that's like for us, if we were to try to go virtual, it's really hard for my brain to comprehend how we would do that for that reason. Yeah, and, and there are certain cases where, where virtuals work very, very well. There may be certain types of education where you need people to be able to watch a few minutes, come back, or you may need them to need to stop it and then rewind and revisit it again. A whole host of, a whole host of reasons like that. Um, but there are also certain things that people really missed when they weren't doing live. And part of it is the collaboration it's leaning over to the person next to you and going, how did you do that? Or what are you doing differently than what I'm doing? And that's what people really want. They want that connectivity. And if, if you think about it, we all had our networks and our behaviors before the pandemic and the pandemic changed a lot of them. A lot of the groups that used to get together no longer get together. Everybody's trying to figure out, okay, where are these connections now? And there's a huge opportunity to step in. And, and I wouldn't say there's a void anymore because there's a ton of stuff out there now, but there's a huge opportunity to come in and address things in the way that's most valuable for your, um, your audience, which you might not have messed with four or five years ago because it's working. Yeah, that, that's really, that, that, those are good points. What, um, you mentioned that the digital, what, so when, the, when, when some of the, um, some of the uh, brands are like, when they're using digital, is it just another touch point or is it really like, or is there a void there? You, you, you used the word void. And I was curious if that was a void and that there was something missing or was it just another touch point? No, no, the, the brands, the brands are using digital very, very effectively. They, they rushed to market. Um, everybody had a pretty steep learning curve, but they came out the other side and they understand what each platform does really well and how to use digital. Mm -hmm. So most brands have 
planned webinars or webcasts or podcasts, and then they also do a lot of things opportunistically. Um, it's a great way to bring people together. And then, and then people talking about technology, think about it this way. How many people now watch Netflix with the captions on? Guilty. Okay. <laughs> so, so nobody did that four or five years ago because technology wasn't there. Now you've got stylists who are hearing impaired. You have people who are watching education on their phone while they're in transit. You have all these different situations where in the past you wouldn't be able to communicate with these people. And now, you know, because of things like this, uh, it's not only the captions, but it's other languages as well. There's this accessibility that the digital age has really provided. The challenge is you went from very limited education, which was only available in certain situations, certain time, to a ton of education. And now the real challenge is how do you gatekeep yourself so you really spend your time on what's most valuable? Well, I'll pat ourselves on the back because for the last couple of years, we've um, um, at Presley Poe and Friends, um, our, our flagship event that happens every April, um, we've actually had uh, uh, 10 or 15 um, hearing impaired uh, artists there. And we've um, we've we've hired some um, uh, signers. What are they called? Interpreters. interpreters. Yeah. The sign language interpreters to come in and, and, and do. And that. this year we're going to have um, closed captions up on the screen as the as the educators are speaking, because we've also found that um, among like ASL or deaf stylists, um, we ha that's we have the two rows of them. But then there's also the hearing impaired that they they don't want to say anything. They're afraid to you know say something or they don't want to be a, a bother or a burden. And, you know, so but with our show, it's we're all about inclusivity and we're trying to make sure everyone can can be a part of it. So it's something that we were just some it was like in passing someone had mentioned it, but it wasn't even something we thought to ask about. You know, it's like we're covering ASL, but not. Um, not in between. Yeah, not the, 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 the in between. So that was something that was a big learn for us. I'm curious with the paper. Um, was it did you just speak to brands or did you speak to Silas as well? Well, I mean, our official interviews were with brands, but, you know, as part of this, uh, we're constantly speaking to people. And every time we talk to somebody and something comes up, you know, the question to ask is why? Why do you think that is? You know, how is that translating into your life? So uh, the initial the initial feedback was, here's what the brands were finding their communities wanted. But we started going out and talking to lots and lots of other people. And the thing about any kind of research is it's never really done. Uh, and you might want to <laughs> up there from now or six months from now. Um, and the industry is going to evolve. What, what everyone keeps asking is, you know, what is the new normal? And that implies that you reach a point where things get kind of static. And the sense is there really isn't a new normal, except for the fact the new normal is things are always going to change. And now that everybody understands that they do have flexibility and they do have the ability to change pretty quickly, they can manage it, um, they're going to continue to change being at the forefront of change gives you a leg up. I love that. I mean, and I think it's so important as educators, if you're going to be teaching, you know, you need to be ready to change. You need to be ready to evolve. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, certainly those are easy words, but it's, it's actually like seeing where it's evolving and where it's coming from as well. Right. Like it, it, it's easy words to say, Oh, we need to evolve as an industry, but, but to kind of know what that evolution looks like. Um, I know, but the fact that it's like, you know, always changing and there is no new normal. Like, I love that. I love that. It's just always going to be a pivot. You're such a millennial. Um, <laughs> actually, uh, good. this is a good pivot. So Steve, Katie did bring up, bring up uh, the age differences. What, what, what was the white paper saying as far as like, uh, as far as the age gaps, not the age gaps. I don't want to say gap because it's not, not between, but like, uh, are there different generations that are learning different ways or needing different things? Yeah, that's, that's, a critically important topic and uh, beauty changes lives, which I'm involved with had an industry leader round table at ABS. And we had 70 industry leaders and probably 35% of them, 35 of them, half of them were older, mostly CEOs, presidents of companies. And then the other half were younger um, who were 
people ascending in their careers. And it represented schools and brands and salons and a little bit of everything. And we also referenced the white paper that came out of that. Uh, so we had a lot of learnings related to that. And they really translate to uh, this generation, the newer generation in education. And one of the things to keep in mind is that the balance has shifted a little bit, the balance of power, because in the old days, um, there were ways of doing things and things change very, very quickly. And younger people are much more uh, able to deal with change. They uh, were much, much more comfortable with digital. So to a certain extent, a lot of them led the charge here. And a lot of older people felt like they were being dragged along. And one of the really interesting things that we found was that people, and, and this shouldn't surprise anyone, you like to learn from someone your generation. You want to hear from somebody your generation. And back in the old days, uh, when we were involved with Beacon, we had two of our editors, Maggie Mulhern and Alison Alhamid, who were probably 30 years separated in age, would get on stage together and talk. And that's happening a lot now because younger people, um, they don't necessarily connect with the older stylist as well. And the older people don't necessarily connect with the younger stylists as well. So the way somebody described it to me was think about a football game you're watching on TV and you've got the play-by-play -play person and the color person. And they reflect those two groups. And depending upon how they're talking about things, their roles change. So it may be that something is being explained by an older person and the younger person says, what this really means you know, to you is this or vice versa. And it seems like a lot of brands were doing that very, very successfully. Some hadn't even really thought about it, but were doing it and others were thinking about it quite a bit and saying, we... We need to understand that we are an industry of generations. We have four, possibly five generations in the workplace right now. And uh, they're all important, but they all do things differently. I've noticed, and again, this is completely anecdotal, but like, um, especially when it comes to like ticket sales and stuff, and I want to get into that as well about how people are purchasing. Um, but it, it seems like the younger independent artists are having less trouble like selling, selling out their classes. And I don't know if it's a communication thing. I don't know if it's how to be found thing, or even I could just be full of shit too. I'm, I, I'm okay with that as well. But, but anecdotally, I, I, I kind of, I'm kind of seeing that like it's, it's the younger, younger artists that are able to book up their classes. Um, I don't want to say easily because nothing's easy, but, 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 but quickly. It, it, it may be that, uh, and, and we didn't study this specifically, but it may be, that the younger audience, the, the younger artists have grown up nurturing their audience and they can bring their audience with them more effectively because they're more connected to them. Yeah. That's what, I mean, that's what it feels like. Even at ABS last year, like uh, the classrooms and the lines that were just there to meet, like some of the TikTok people or some of the TikTok hairdressers was extraordinary. You know, like, like, like Sam walks by and no one even like blinks an eye. I was just going to say, when someone doesn't know who Sam Via is, I'm like, what are you, do you live under a rock? <laughs> but, but, it's not, but it's not even about, yeah, but, amazing, but yeah, I mean, but it's, yeah. it's just, it is just, I, I think it's just a generational thing, yeah. you know, yeah, it, no. like, I, I don't know, I don't know what Sam's presence is like on TikTok or not, I don't want to use Sam necessarily, but anybody's presence is on TikTok compared to the ones that are really doing it on TikTok and the lines that they had. It, it was, it was eye opening to me. Like this is, this is the generational quote unquote divide because you can see who's in the line, right? You can see who's in the line and all of them are about the same age as, as, as these TikTok people and, and i i throw no shade at anybody that's making any that's doing anything in the industry don't hope nobody takes it as shade but it was just it was just an interesting kind of like oh okay i see that now you know and it, it's just, it, it's interesting and, and i love the idea of kind of like being able to bring to bring different generations together as well I, I i love that idea and i love the concept of that were they teaching like they were um stylists and and educators or they were just um yeah so they were having they had classrooms but then they would have like you know step and repeat meet and greets but like 
like at ABS, literally at the bottom of the escalator. We're not talking about like they were hidden someplace at the bottom of the escalator. Cause I was like, you know, I just wanted to get in line, like, you know, like a Russian bread line. You know, I'm like, like, what are all these people standing for? There must be something cool going on. And then you look ahead and you're like, oh, it's it's the TikTokers, you know, um, yeah. and, and people wanted to meet them and, and enjoy them. It's like the next it's the newest or the next version of what we had as far as influencers from, you know, 2017, 2018 or, or two, we'll go 2014 to 2018 uh, with that. It was definitely like that. that's who was standing in those lines. And it's 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 also somewhat aspirational because I think if you ask those people, they say that's what I'd like to be. I, I think that that's it. And and what social does is it allows anybody to play. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Everybody has so a seat at the table. It, yeah. It, well, yeah. This, this is my point about any social media. Like, you know, if you have a million followers on TikTok, like, I, I don't throw any shade to that because there's something you're you're delivering something. Let, let's not forget that we're all. When it comes to social media, we're all in the attention business, you know, and, and they've just kind of figured out how to how to generate the most the most attention. So, again, I have no shade to it. I don't like you hear so many people complain about like, oh, they don't do anything. They don't. Have, I'm like, well, they're doing something mm -hmm. right because you can't just open up a TikTok and you have you have this much attention like you're earning that attention. You know, that's well, my two cents. If you go back in time, um, 10, 15 years, uh, the educators who were the best entertainers used to get the big audiences and and you can't discount the fact that there's an entertainment component to all of this and it's a skill set to be able to attract an audience and hold an audience that's that's a thousand percent for sure you know? and, mm -hmm. and 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 to your point it's a lot easier to get an audience than it is to hold an audience you know yeah. you got to be consistently entertaining and consistently bring consistently bring the value you're just figuring out what the value is what is the insight to um, people waiting so long to purchase tickets for things that are in person? I don't know. Ask the Swifties. <laughs> I don't get it. I don't get the waiting. So, especially if you have to travel. Yeah, I, I, I think everybody likes having something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's education and there's entertainment. And to the extent that you can justify the entertainment because it's education, maybe it makes it easier for people to spend their time and money on things. And in either case, it, it's your life. You should do absolutely what you want to do. But the people who figured out how to take advantage of that, and I don't mean take advantage in a bad way, but how to you know, attract these people, my hat's off to them because that's a talent and that's often a gift. Yeah, that... I, I don't understand that, but you know, I don't think it's any different by the way. I, I think, I think our industry has always kind of been that way, you know, just kind of waiting for stuff. Now, you know, again, when we were brand centric, um, I think that there's a little bit more pressure from um, like even the salons you worked at, you know, like I know that the salon, this is my experience. First off, let me just throw that out there. But the, but the, but the, the companies that I worked for, you know, they had brand relationships. So just like when we worked at Bella, like, like Red Game would put together this thing and then, you know, either through their points or through, you know, our own thing, we, there was definitely pressure to go to like this Red Game event. event yeah, sure. You know? But, but, yeah. but if there wasn't the independent stuff, I think, I think a lot of the education was being driven by the salons and by the brands. And I think things have changed a lot with, with the independence and I'm not sure that people even know how to commit to that. I don't know. I could, uh, any insight, Steve? No. <laughs> <laughs> i mean that, that, that's interesting in itself too just that i mean we brought up sam like sam was the face of redkin for so many years like mm -hmm. he was the face of redkin and now like that's not it, it's not it's not the same anymore right like, like it's not just the you know if you went to a, if you went to a redkin event it was always sam via stepping you, he was the face of redkin if you went to a well event it was always the uh it was it was always uh, um christopher and um sona they were like the face of these well of these weller brands and, and now like there's millions of these faces that you can be inspired by and it's not just the same faces on the stage um for so long i also think that i also think what it's done is uh, is it's softened the industry a little bit because i think i think a lot of people were were we're fighting to be the face of something, you know, and then in, in, in turn, it just kind of made like this nasty, like undercurrent of like just grossness in the industry. And I think what happened certainly with, with, uh, with 
with social media is it gave it gave everybody a seat like we talked about earlier gave everybody a seat at the table or anybody that 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 wanted that attention like was able to get it and I actually think it softened because I mean even with our experience again this is a clearly anecdotal but even with our experience and the access that we have to people there's very very few people that 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 we've had access to that I was like uh not my kind of person you know what I mean or or I felt yeah. gross around like yeah, very, very 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 few few people like that so I'm actually I'm optimistic about that you know that we're just a better kinder sweeter uh softer softer in industry no insight I mean way maybe one way to think about it is in the old days you had ABC CBS and NBC and they decided what you saw now you decide what you want to see the balance of power is completely shifted because there's so much out there and maybe that's the way it used to be and you know cable tv is the way it is right now you know what that's a brilliant brilliant and analogy tv that's a brilliant analogy and i think that that's the generational divide too right like, like there's a lot of people in this industry that have never been that have that have never had education from a brand specific thing you know because again there is so much independent education and there there are so many people that are making a name for themselves independently you know or have ever watched you know three network tv mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and and younger people question everything because they have information at their fingertips and they can I and totally missed the day. That, that, that curiosity, I mean, I really applaud. I, absolutely. I, I really missed the days like when we were young, Steve, and like we could just bullshit our way through something and nobody <laughs> could fact check you. That, that, th those are the best days, man. <laughs> we, could, we could talk about the sky being red and, and nobody could fact check you. Except look up. <laughs> I mean, it's all perspective. <laughs> okay, but you, you, but you don't know what I'm seeing. Sure, you know oh, that's so dumb. What, what, what? When uh, do you after the white paper comes out or before the white paper goes out? Do you get together as a team and you guys kind of discuss what you're going to put in it or what you're going to omit from it or what's relevant and what's not relevant? Yes, and uh, when you've had conversations with lots of people and it's it's not just me it's the rest of the research team and other people at pivot point uh the cream kind of rises to the top in terms of what people are most interested in but also what's going to be the most valuable either to reinforce things that they suspected um, and validate that or to make them look at things a little bit differently or there's always that item which wow i never even thought about that uh the, the, the challenge is fitting everything in this format because there's so much more you can put in here. And before this became a white paper, it was a PowerPoint presentation slash discussion. And there were dozens of those presentations and discussions. What was the consent? What was the uh, the consensus of low? I, I never kind of thought about it that way. Like as the team got together, were there any like big ahas or like, oh, shit, I didn't see that. Well, it depends on the person. I mean, everybody looks at things from their own perspective, which is tied to what they do and perhaps how old they are, where they came from or things like that. So really um, nothing uniformly. This was one of the the first research projects I've worked on. I've worked on a lot where there really wasn't this big smoking gun that somebody that people said, oh, my God, I had no idea. Right. Well, did you have a big aha when you read it? Um, no. Not like big, like, no, everything I read, it was very consistent with, you know, kind of what, what we'd seen or what we thought was happening. I mean, we have a lot of relationships in the industry, so we have a lot of insight and perspective, I think. So we're kind of different in that way. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, it was pretty on point with what we've seen and, you know. Mm. Nothing that blew me away that I was like, holy shit, there's no way, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, I, I for sure, if you're listening in and um and and you're planning on doing any kind of event, and I don't care if it's like independent or whatever, I think I think it's 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 a super valuable uh, paper, and um the way that it's presented is very easy to kind of follow follow along. Yeah, and, definitely. And, read, and the way that it's broken down, I mean, it's 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 basically broken down into like a PowerPoint kind of like format. Um, and 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 it's like, what's it called when you put bullet out, so bullet point? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, like, it's like bullet pointed out. So it, it, it's really, really great. Uh, Steve, what other uh, what other uh, white papers are, are Pivot Point working on or, or about to release that that, that you want to share? 
Well, I mentioned the generational white paper we did, and I think people will find that very, very interesting. Uh, we're going to have a webcast version of that coming out soon. Uh, we did some very, very interesting research recently on career counselors. And one of the challenges with our industry is we need to attract more of the right people and we need to retain more of the right people. And when you hear statistics that over the past 10 years, the average hairdresser has gone from working 40 hours a week to 27 hours a week, you know, obviously that creates a, a vacuum and pretty much any salon owner you talk to will tell you that their biggest challenge is finding people. So uh, that's something that's, that's really important. And what's really changed is perceptions about careers versus college. So if you think about four or five years ago, everyone had to go to college. You know, that was what you were expected to do. And not going to college was kind of a failure, I suppose. Um, what's happened is you had the whole conversation about the student debt loan repayment. And all of a sudden, everybody realized how much money they owed mm -hmm. from going to college. And parents started saying, I'm still paying off my debt. Do so I want to saddle my child with this? And then around the same time AI came out, and AI is the first technology shift that doesn't impact the blue collar workers as much as the white collar workers. So all of a sudden, uh, careers which you thought were safe careers and college educated careers, that was no longer the case. So there's been this massive shift in terms of how people are thinking about things. And that's really been um, a big, big part of the focus. Uh, in going to the career counselors, because these are the people who are closest to it. Their job is to inform their students on possible career choices. And what we found was that by a significant margin, they felt that um, careers were trending versus college. And then the most interesting thing was we asked them across different dimensions, uh, including job satisfaction, including uh, career earning opportun opportunities and then job security. And uh, in every single case, careers outperformed college. So if you're looking at that audience, there's a sea change in terms of how they're thinking about things. So this is really our moment in time. And what we really need to do is make sure that People understand what this career is, how you can get into this career. A lot of people have no idea that they have to go to beauty school, they need licensure or anything like that. And basically um, attract the people who belong. And we know there are a lot of people out there who might belong in this industry, just looking at how many people are following our industry on social media. Well, if we get all those people to understand, there might be a place for you here. And it's an opportunity for you to be artistic, give back, be with people who are part of your tribe and make a good living. You know, if, if, if you work at it, um, that's what we really have to focus on. That's why we did that research. And we have a few more things I can't really talk about now that uh, are in the works. Um, but the intent is to address the topics that are critically important, but maybe aren't getting a lot of attention because there are no dollars tied to them. And that's really consistent with what Pivot Point tries to do, which is elevate the industry. I love that. I love that too. I love that so much. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, I, I think we might have we might have covered this, but but how does how do how does Pivot Point decide what they're going to put the research into? It's it's just based on conversations. Uh, we do a, mo most of the research we do is for internal purposes to find out what the market wants, how we should respond in terms of our products, our services, things like that. Um, what we're now doing is when we do that research, we're saying, is there a piece of this that might be appropriate to share with the rest of the industry? So that's really what we're working on. And then there are certain topics um, that just demand attention because they're critically important. Well, we appreciate you being willing to share all this information because as Gordon Miller says, it, there is just nothing like this. It's so hard for us to get this information in the industry. And 
um, it's important for us to know this and to understand it. And, and, you know, I, I just really appreciate it. It makes, it makes it so awesome to learn these things. Yeah. Like with, within one week's period, our entire like pitch deck has changed yeah. because, now, because it's no longer, you know, we're, we're no longer like a pitching from hunches. We're pitching from like, we're okay, like, here's the pivot proof pivot. on page seven. <laughs> pivot points research. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know, there's another thing. Um, a lot of us go to a lot of industry events and we all see each other all the time. And sometimes we start thinking that everybody else is exposed to as many different perspectives and point of views as and, and, and activities as we are. And the reality is a lot of people aren't. Yeah. So if you can give them uh, a better insight into the industry and, and open up the window for them to see here's what's going on. Hopefully it can help them in their careers. You know, what's really interesting. And I don't know if this is related or not, but, but, but it's certainly worth the conversation is that um, we, again, for Presley Poe and friends, it's definitely our flagship show. It's what we've done. We're doing, we're, we're, we're in the, we're in the midst of, of planning our fifth year, but we have people that literally fly in all over the country for it. And we only have 150 tickets for sale. So it's not like a, it's not a huge, like, you know, ticket sale uh, um, event. Um, but uh but we have people flying from all over the country, Steve, but for whatever reason, we can't get anybody literally in the town that it's held in to buy tickets. It's like, it's so, it's so crazy to me that, that, that we can attract people from again, across the country, but we can't attract people from across the street. So I lived in New York city for a long time. And you know, when I went to the statue of Liberty, when you right, look at your I was going to move to Atlanta. Because I was thinking about it and I was guessing the first question they were going to ask me in Atlanta was, oh, you lived in New York. Did you ever go to the Statue of Liberty? And I didn't want to be that guy who said, no, I've never been there. I so mean, listen, we live in D.C. We get That's it. That's a good point. Yeah, cause it's museums and everything. And it's when it's in your backyard, you just don't and utilize the, it. And the only time you go is when you have out of town guests. Right. You know? Yeah. That, that that's fair well come on man come on maryland come on, come show up to our event you, down. you know and like and i'm fighting it like i'm like we're bringing in great educators we're bringing in big names we're bringing in i don't know yeah I but maybe some of it is the educators and their people who follow them like their communities that follow them and that's what you know because they come from all over the place too yeah that's fair yeah all right cool steve <laughs> uh a, a, anything else to talk about anything else to promote anything what, what are you up to well, one thing I do want to talk about is uh, Pivot Point's Cap Series mannequins. And the challenge with mannequins is that they've been the same for years and years and years. And in a school environment where space is limited, you can only fit a couple of them in a locker. Um, if you're going to an academy and it's a multiple day academy and you have three mannequins, it's kind of hard to take them home with you. Um, a lot of them go into uh, garbage mm -hmm. and uh, there needed to be something done. And Pivot Point's been working on this a really long time, but they uh, have really finally perfected what they call the cap mannequin. And what it is, is that the head form and the hair are two separate pieces. And the advantages of that are once you get a head form, you can add as many hair pieces as you want. So you can fit lots of things in a locker. You can take all of your hair home with you. Um, it's also sustainable. And we announced it into Coiffure this uh, past weekend that we have a program with Green Circle Salons. We're launching it with schools uh, to recycle the mannequins. And that's the first, and that's dramatic. Uh, the other thing is we know that people want educators who look like them. They want clients who look like people want to feel like they're part of something. And these are completely mix and match. So you can mix texture and hair and, and, and skin tone and a whole host of other things to really make it much more customizable. So this is going to be huge. Um, it's a, it's a dramatic improvement in, in, Something, again, people have taken for granted and not really questioned for a long, long time. So I'm very proud to work for a company that really cares about these things and is, is, is being an agent of change. That's pretty amazing. I can't wait to get my hands on one. I know, That's, me too. Yeah. Are they for yeah. sale now, Steve? They're out now, yes. Uh, and uh, pivotpoint.com, pivotpoint. 
You can you can go to uh, pivotpoint.com. On pivotpoint.com, uh, we have our education, and then we also have our mannequins, and you can find either one. If you're interested in the white paper we talked about, go to pivotpoint.com, go all the way to the footer on the page and click on research. There's a little bit of information on our research services and all the way at the bottom of the page, access to some of our more recent uh, research uh, projects. I'm pretty sure I've sent it to everyone in the industry at this point. So, <laughs> so they don't need to, they don't need to look it up. Yeah. Or just DMK to show some. No, yeah, I've been sending it to everyone twice today, actually. Same. I, I, yeah. I, sent, it, I sent, I was in a, uh, I was in a meeting last night and we were talking about it and I sent it to them. I'm like, have you seen this? Yeah. You know, like whenever so the word events comes up, actually what was interesting too, I was talking about it on a call last night and on the call was a outside of the industry, not outside of the industry, but, but an event planner, like a proper event planner, like not like a, not just, just a hair event. And, and um, when I was talking about the white paper and the way that I understood it, she said, that seems to be the trend across all events and across, you know, everything. It's, it's, oh, not, just, you know, so it's not just like within the industry, like these mm. are the trends, the same stuff that you guys found is kind of like a, a universal trend when it comes to events and, and how, pe how people are showing up. So well, one thing I will add is that there are a few companies who are doing things very, very differently and they're outliers, but the thinking is that when everybody zigs, we zag. And because of that, um, maybe we get more attention or we can do things a little bit differently. Um, think about how much mail you used to get. You used uh -huh. to get a whole pile of mail. Now you get very few letters. So when you get a letter, maybe it's more special than it used to be. Mm. Mm. Katie, why are you why are you over there smiling like that? <laughs> well, because of with Jay yeah, Ladner experience. We're we're zaggers, we're not ziggers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that like, was weird. Not really. I mean, like, but th that's fair. You know, now that now that this paper's been validated, we got to keep moving. So Stephen come up with another paper. Yeah. Come, Stephen come with a zag paper and say, you know, like how on trend we are. So we have to, it forces us to to, to move on, to evolve. That's awesome. Steve, thanks for your time, man. It's, it's always a pleasure to see both of you. And um, thank you very much for giving me a chance to talk about this. I appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And we will, we will like, like Steve said, we'll see you at about, I don't know, 100 shows this year. Something yeah. like that. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, Mr. Steve Reese, thank you very, very much for joining us on your day off. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, share it with friends, give us a rating and drop a review to listen to all the latest podcasts. Please subscribe from your favorite podcast outlet and to stay connected on and off the show. You can follow us at hair Street on Instagram and all other social media platforms. Thanks again. And we'll see you next time. Peace and love.